Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at New Dublin. If you are joining us online, we want to give you a special welcome as well. We're glad uh, that you are worshiping with us in that way. There are announcements in your bulletin. There are a lot of announcements in your bulletin, and they're important. So we're going to spend maybe a little time, more time than we usually do on them. Uh, First, I've been reminded, this is not written, but I was reminded this morning that committee night is on Tuesday. So uh, if you're on a committee, please be in touch with your committee chair, uh, and we will will have that. Uh, Sunday school is resuming indoors at 10 o'clock. Next week, we're going to be figuring out what we kind of want to do long term, so uh, please come if you're interested. It'll be in the fellowship hall. If you are interested in learning more about membership at New Dublin, we will be having a new members class in June, and we will set that according to when it is convenient for the people involved. So if you're interested in joining a new member class, uh, please let me know, and I'll be in touch, and we'll set a time that's good for everybody. Finally, in response to the changes that have come and are coming to uh, the state guidelines and to the CDC, our worship is also changing. You may have noticed masks are now optional everywhere and also here at New Dublin. We do encourage you, if you're not comfortable or if you're not vaccinated, to continue to wear a mask. Uh, But if you are vaccinated, you do not have to. Because we just like meeting outdoors, uh, we will continue to do so on the first Sunday of every month in the summer, weather permitting. Uh, But on other Sundays, we will be moving inside starting on May the 30th. That's next Sunday. We're going to open all the windows in the sanctuary and these doors and the doors uh, to, you know, going into the CE wing and to the shepherd's room. And in the shepherd's room, we're going to put uh, window fans in to keep good air circulation. And assuming that what they say will happen does in fact happen and that social distancing guidelines are lifted on the 28th, we will mark off a part of the sanctuary for people who would like to continue to social distance. We will carry out cleaning and disinfection as is required by the CDC and by the Virginia Department of Health. And we will continue um, to hold communion like this for the foreseeable future. And we will continue to do the offering through the offering boxes, which when we're inside, we will put um, at each door to the sanctuary. We welcome your feedback. Let me know if you have questions or concerns. Uh, We do care uh, about those things. What else needs to come to our attention this morning? Then let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And let us join together in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. The Lord has given us his promise. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let us pray. Lord our God, we thank you that you have given us the same spirit that you gave to your apostles on the day of Pentecost. And we ask that as we pray and praise and worship, your spirit would pray with us so that all we do would be pleasing to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this
was having a conversation with someone right before worship about the capacity of sheep to escape from very small places. And that Jesus knew what he was talking about when he compared us to sheep. Because we all have escaped, we have all gone our own ways. But we do have a patient and capable shepherd who always goes after us and always welcomes us back to the fold. So let us confess our sins to God and to one another with confidence. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared to the world in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O merciful God, for his sake, that we may live a holy, just, and humble life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The scriptures are true and worthy of full acceptance when it tells us that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and be at peace. to hear the scriptures read and the gospel proclaimed, let us pray. Father, we are thankful that you have given us these scriptures, not because you were bound to or because you had to, but because you love us and want us to know you. We pray that you would give us receptive ears and receptive hearts to hear what you have to say to us this morning. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 10 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. When Moses had told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and prepare for the third day, because on the third day the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set limits for the people all around, saying, Be careful not to go up to the mountain or touch the edge of it. Any who touch the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch them but they shall be stoned or shot with arrows, whether animal or human being. They shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they may go up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He consecrated the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Prepare for the third day, and do not go near a woman. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning, as well as a thick cloud on the mountain, and a blast of a trumpet so loud that the people who were in the camp trembled. Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. They took their stand at the foot of the mountain. 
Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. The smoke went up like the smoke of a kiln, while the whole mountain shook violently. (coughs) As the blast of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses would speak, and God would answer him in thunder. When the Lord descended upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people not to break through to the Lord to look. Otherwise, many of them will perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves, or the Lord will break out against them. Moses said to the people, the people said to the Lord, rather, the people are not permitted to come up to Mount Sinai, for you yourself warned us, saying, set limits around the mountain and keep it holy. The Lord said to him, go down and come up, bringing Aaron with you. But do not let either the priests or the people break through to come up to the Lord. Otherwise, he will break out against them. So Moses went to the people and told them. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. The second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. Again, hear the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the, great, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. You know that old saying that familiarity breeds contempt? I think maybe it's a little harsh. I'm sure most of us manage to live with our friends and family without despising them, usually. But what familiarity does do is keep us from noticing things. It can keep us from taking things seriously. I bet the vast majority of you drove here today, and I also bet that most of you did not spend 
very much time contemplating the fact uh, that you were getting into a several ton metal machine and driving at alarming speeds down the highway with other several ton metal machines and that if anything goes wrong, you're in trouble. Because if you did, you might not be here this morning. But I suspect that you didn't think that way because you do it probably several times a day every day. You're familiar with it. You don't need to think about it anymore. And if you did, it might be paralyzing. So we just don't. We don't live in contempt of our driving, but we don't notice it very much. And it's easy for us Christians for God to become that way, like the cars we drive. Because we pray once a day or more, we go to church for worship, we see our friends, we do the same old things we always do, and after a while, it's hard not to lose the sense of reality about it. Language about God and angels and the defeat of death, language about the deepest truths of the universe can begin to go in one ear and out the other without leaving much of a mark. And church begins to be about our own agendas, our social lives, about exercising a little bit of power in a world that's out of our control, maybe another charitable organization. We fall asleep to the reality of what's going on. But every now and then, the Bible reminds us with force that God is not to be trifled with. And today, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible goes off like one of those old-fashioned alarm clocks that wakes everybody up within a 100-foot radius. You know the ones that go back and forth like this, and you stuff them with cotton balls so they don't scare the life out of you. Well, if we don't stuff Pentecost with cotton balls, it has the power to wake us up. It all starts in the book of Exodus, way back when the 12 tribes of Israel are wandering in the desert between the time they leave Egypt and the time they settle in Canaan. What we read this morning is the immediate preparation for the Ten Commandments. Literally the next verse, we start off, right? And God spoke these words to them, I am the Lord your God. That is the next verse. What we read is the preparation. And what comes across through the strangeness of the text, and I bet you noticed the strangeness of the text this morning, what comes across is that God is dangerous, like wildfire, that God requires safety guidelines. They have to consecrate themselves, avoid touching the mountain, wash your clothes, avoid sex. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that you literally can't be a woman or come near a woman. Just, you know, abstain from sexual relationships. Don't come too close to the mountain. And even if an animal does, it has to be put to death from a distance. And the actual presence of the Lord is accompanied by thunder and lightning and fire and smoke and trumpets. And the whole sense is of this God who is unapproachable and even dangerous in his holiness. A text like this makes sense of Isaiah's distress when he comes into the presence of God it reminds us of the burning bush that Moses has to turn aside to see and take off his sandals to approach. It's not a God that you can get used to, the God that we meet in Exodus this morning. Not a God to treat casually. When God shows up, you have to take precautions or you might die. And then out of the majesty of fire and smoke and thunder and trumpets, the Lord speaks to his people and gives, us, gives them what we call the Ten Commandments. That's the original day of Pentecost. Long before Jesus, Pentecost was and still is a minor Jewish holiday called Shavuot, and 
it celebrates the occasion when Moses gives, uh, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. So when the Acts reading says that when the day of Pentecost came, that's what they're talking about. That's why all these people are in Jerusalem on one day. If you could afford it, you all went to Jerusalem to celebrate the law, the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it's a celebration because the law isn't just a to-do list. It's a celebration that such a powerful and awe-inspiring and, frankly, dangerous God chose to be their God. The giving of the law was the beginning of a relationship. It's not just a to-do list or a bunch of do's and don'ts. It brings them into contact with God and to their deepest flourishing. So the giving of the law is worth celebrating because it's a shockingly gracious act. And so when we say, as we sometimes do, that the Christian Pentecost is the birthday of the church, we need to be careful because what we're not saying is that Pente Christian Pentecost just supersedes and replaces all of the activity that God had been doing with his people to that point because God is faithful and you can count on him to keep his promises and not to just change directions and reject the people who were his people before and pick new ones. God has always caused people to be in a relationship with him. So in that sense, the church has always existed, and Pentecost is a continuation of that faithfulness more than it is a disruption and a new beginning. God hasn't fundamentally changed or disrupted his relationship with his people, but on Pentecost, the nature of that relationship changes. On that particular celebration of Pentecost, that particular celebration of the giving of the law to Moses, God's fire shows back up again. Just like before, fire comes down from heaven. In a sense, it's a new giving of the law, not in the sense that it's a simple repetition of what happened before on Mount Sinai. Once again, God reveals himself to his people and draws them in relationship with him. But this time there's a difference. This time that carefully guarded distance is removed. The apostles don't come to a mountain they can't touch. The fire falls on them directly. They each become little Mount Sinai's. They each become little burning bushes. The God that the people had to stand far off from, the God that only the priests could approach with a lot of precautions and preparation, has now approached them. And they survive it. It's not a new relationship, but it is a shift in the relationship. It becomes more familiar. It becomes more family. There's a reason it happens then and not before, after Jesus' ascension and not before. Jesus came to be our big brother and caused us to be adopted by the Father as his child, his children. And after Jesus ascends to heaven, he promises that he wouldn't leave them as orphans. Not as if you didn't have a father or a mother to live with you. The Holy Spirit would come. We've been drawn up in one sense into familiarity with God, in the sense of family with God. On the second Pentecost, we who Jesus has made his family received a gift. We became a little burning bush, a little Mount Sinai. Joel, the prophet, puts it this way, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
And on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And prophecy in the Bible doesn't mean precisely what we mean by it now. It's not foretelling the future. It's much more like what Peter begins to do immediately, right? It's more like preaching, more like witnessing to the truth of what God has already done and is doing and will do in the world. It's witnessing to God's faithfulness and glory. Like little burning bushes, like little Mount Sinai's, God speaks through his church. And it's not limited anymore to a particular class of people, carefully prepared priests, not limited by gender or class or race. We've all been called. We've all become prophets. On the second Pentecost, God drew near to us to be in a family relationship. It's a major, major act of grace, not something we can or should get used to and forget about and take for granted. Because it's not done primarily for our sake, not so that we can be impressive, so that the people can look at us and see how holy and pious we are. The bush burned so that Moses would see it and encounter the living God. Mount Sinai flashed with lightning and thunder so that the people of Israel would know who the true God is and what it means to be in relationship with him. If we have a share in that same flame, if we're in the same church, united by the same truth, bound together by the same spirit as the apostles, and we are, we mustn't let the familiarity of it all dull us. We mustn't let the familiarity turn us inward and occupy us with our own internal friendships and goals and politics. God's Spirit hasn't come upon us to turn us into a social club, even a good and pious and holy social club. We are people who have been sent to prophesy in our neighborhoods and our communities and the world, to share the message of the good news, to bear witness to the kingdom of God that is already coming among us, to seek the well-being and flourishing of everyone who comes into contact with the living God, until all become little burning bushes, little Mount Sinai's, until everyone is lit with the glory and holiness and knowledge of God. So to the God of all grace, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more abundantly than all we could ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the profession of our faith that you will find in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Friends, I learned things, lots of things, last week, but I did not come back any less absent-minded. So uh, despite what the bulletin says, we are having communion this Sunday, and we will have it now. Uh, but I won't ask you to say anything, because nothing is written in your bulletin for you to read. Uh, but we are celebrating Pentecost through the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and we will turn to that now.
Does everybody have what they need to celebrate communion? If not, raise your hand and we will get it to you. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table together in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. Do not come because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because any of us by our own merits is righteous, but because we all stand in need of the forgiving grace of God. Do not come to prove yourself right or to prove an opinion, but to celebrate a presence. The Lord has made everything ready. Come and eat. Let us pray. Father of mercy and God of all comfort, we acknowledge that you are the Lord and we honor your greatness and your glory because you created us in your own image when you were free to do otherwise. But primarily because you freed us from the enslavement of sin through your only Son. You gave him in love to be made like us in all things except sin, that by his death and resurrection he might bring life again to the world. Lord, we confess that we are not able to understand the breadth and length and height and depth of your love. But true to the command of Jesus Christ our Lord, we come to this table which he has left to us to be used in remembrance of his death until he comes again. Here we declare and witness before the world that by him alone we have received liberty and life. By him alone you claim us as children and heirs. By him alone we have access to your favor. By him alone we are raised to your spiritual kingdom there to eat and drink with you and the Son at the joyful table of eternal life. In this present time, we on earth have communion with you in heaven. But in the time to come, we shall be raised to the endless joy prepared for us before the foundation of the world was laid. We acknowledge we have received these gifts by your free mercy and grace through your only Son, Jesus Christ. Moved by your Holy Spirit, we, your congregation, give you all thanks, praise, and glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus also said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful for this meal, which you have given us as a foretaste of the feast that you have prepared in heaven. And we pray that it would give us strength and courage to serve you in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn is written in your bulletin. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you all, now and forever. Amen.